2,000 miles from any continental landmass, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, lies paradise, abundant with food, water, and a lush tropical climate. A promise to live forever in fulfillment and happiness on tiny jewels of life, so calm, so enticing. The island resources of water, land, and beauty seem limitless and never ending. We are limited by space. We are limited by resources. If you go up high enough, you can see the edge of our entire existence. At some point, we have to say, we have enough growth, we need to start improving the quality of our lives. That's where our growth should be. But many people don't have those, those same values and understanding of the need to live in harmony with nature and you know, keep that balance. As far as living on the island and the way we're living now, I see disaster ahead. Nobody's willing to sacrifice anything anymore. And we all want to be the haves. And if everybody has, look where we're, we're taking ourselves to. I mean, it's really total destruction. What's happening is that lands are going poho. Lands are being wasted, are being lost forever. And once they're lost, uh, it's easy to kind of, um, to think you can bring them back, but you can't bring them back anymore. If we only have X amount of resources, and the human de demands are greater than that, when does living just become survival? At a certain point, islanders feel drawn to navigate, to plot a course for survival. But along the way, there are distractions and confusion. Adrift in our voyage to the future, we are searching for signs and trying to read the markers along the way. I sometimes sense that we have this tremendous human energy here, and it's rushing around day to day in this daily cycle. But I'm not so sure where the whole entirety of it's going. And uh, like any other voyage, we, we never sail without a destination. And what troubles me about the future, I don't know what the destination is. There was a forecast which was a straight extrapolation of what was happening then, which everyone agreed would be horrible, the worst possible thing that could happen. That's Hawaii today. In terms of the number of people here, in terms of uh, pollution problems, cost of living, all of those things have now met or exceeded our worst fears of the early 1970s. We individually and collectively sort of gave up worrying about the future, in my opinion, when the future began to look dark with the first uh, oil crisis and the economic restructuring and all the rest. We got sort of worried about the present and forgot about the consequences of the future. We're past the point of wondering whether we should try to think about limiting growth. Everybody thinks about it. When I think about you know, unlimited growth, what I think about is a cancer cell. To me, it's an example of something that grows, but it cannibalizes its host to the point where its host no longer exists. As long as we embrace growth as the, the only way to have more, and as long as we always perceive more as better, we will be digging ourselves further and further into a hole here from which we can't escape. Decay is not obvious, even if it is right in front of us. Change can happen so slowly that we become accustomed to loss. There is less of what there was. Over there, the gravel is high. So we need to take up some gravel and throw on that side. So the water flows in faster. When I was five years old, back in um, 1950, we, had, we could harvest V from the river. But now, there no V exists in Waipio. And the O'opo too is another form of life in the river that is very sensitive to anything that is a pollutant in the water. So a lot of the O'opo is disappearing. 
but human beings today they don't really notice what's happening to the river or the ocean because when I go in the ocean I can see that especially in Kona that all the corals that used to be around me when I went there are not there no more and all the different kinds of fish that used to flourish there are not there no more in abundance so that tells me something that's happening to the ocean if you look at Genesis it says increase multiply and subdue the earth use nature for your own ends if you look at capitalism it talks about nature as resources and suggests to you that these are inexhaustible resources and the truth is uh, that notion is wrong and we see it happening all around us there's absolutely no question that our resources are not going to produce the kind of future that we're living right now if we continue to use them the same way Everybody that's uh, here and alive in Hawaii now is really living at a time where it's a real blessing because we're enjoying a natural environment that is incomparably more beautiful than the people that will live here in a hundred years. We're driven by population and an affluent life here in the islands to think that we can live a high-end life in the middle of nowhere taking dollars or yen from tourists and trading them for goods outside. And truth to tell, the Hawaiians understood that you had to be self-sufficient and live with the environment, not on it. Many cultural traditions reflect our long-standing relationship to the environment, an interdependency of spiritual practice and human survival. Some say a design for our activity remains from the teachings of native Hawaiians, lessons from a people who excel in the science of observation and the discipline of conservation. Hawaiian history is a profound witness to the wisdom of preservation. Well, I think Hawaiians we're in awe of the natural resources and the energy forces of nature, be it the tremendous force of the ocean or Pele in the volcano or the Lono rain clouds that come. And in observing nature, they felt that they were small in, in comparison to this magnificence, and a lot of it was to learn how to adjust to nature, to survive. Well, they recognized the, the interconnection and the interrelationship of the heavens from the mountains out to the deep sea. It was a management program. It was a management of their lives, their spirit within the, um, this place that they lived, this home of theirs. And they also recognized that, I mean, there wasn't choices here. They didn't have shipping companies bringing in their livestock. They needed to live within what these resources provide. And the couple system, I think, was a system of clear enforcement and, and very strict rules and very, by our standards, very severe penalties for breaking that. Because when you break the certain rules, you're breaking the rules for all people that lived here. We know, for example, that the Moa, what is called the Moanalo, which was a, a large um, flightless bird, uh, became extinct probably from the Hawaiians um, using it for food. And those experiences, I think, were probably uh, l lessons that if you don't take care of a resource, that you will lose it. I think their philosophy of life, their, even their, their religion and their beliefs that that the land and the sea were very spiritual powers. And I, if we needed to depend on that tomorrow, I think we'd, we'd take the same attitude too. We have an opportunity now to determine our future, but not without painful choices. Even with advancements in technology, we're still at a loss when it comes to controlling the population. The real question is, how unpleasant will we let life become before we are willing to do something about it? This area is where I grew up, Mauna Loa Bay, and on a dairy farm in the back of New Valley. And um, I mean, enormous changes. And, uh, and I, I think the, 
the most obvious is, is population. It's just the amount of people that are moving to Hawaii and the demands that people put on, on environments. I don't like the congestion and the restrictions that come along with so many people vying for so much. And I don't know what to do with that because I'm just one of, of everybody else that has the same rights to this particular place. I don't think you could find anybody who would think that uh, if the beaches were twice as crowded, it would be better. Or that if the schools were twice as crowded, it would be better. Or let's take it all the way to the limit. If the jails were twice as crowded, it would be better. Nobody wants to be more crowded. And yet that's the reality of it is. That's what's happening with our society. It's getting more and more crowded. We are changing our world, our environment so quickly. Never, it took a million years to make a million human beings. And we may double our population in 20 to 30 years. We go from roughly 1.2 million to 2.4 million people. Now try to envision what that looks like. Sheer numbers of buildings, sheer numbers of cars per mile of road, sheer numbers of demand on water resources, effluent sewage, infrastructure demands. The population of the world now is uh, uh, almost 6 billion people. That's going to double. Uh, in the next 35 years and will perhaps continue to double throughout the 21st century. There's got to be an end to this. The theory has always been that there is a technological fix for our problems. The impact on the environment is the result of population times effluence times technology. So the technology is in essence another demand on the environment. It is not the solution. We in mankind with our abilities, our technologies can change things so quickly. The, what's most important is this for us to make the determination is the change going to be by design or is it just going to happen over time? We are at the point where we are considering desalinization of water and to me that's a horrible idea. It's very energy intensive and it's done for the sole purpose of being able to build more houses and cram more people into our society. There's uh little you can do sort of constitutionally or legally to prevent the growth of population in whatever form. As long as Hawaii is governed by a continental constitution, we have no hope of managing our population. Because the rise in population isn't coming because we're breeding more children. It's coming from outsiders being able to come into an island situation unfettered. So this, this real serious problem has to come back to population. We are only going to be allowed one replacement child for each of us. Two people, two children, that's it. Past that, you now have a tax penalty. And the penalty would get gradually more severe. And that's one way to signal people that there is some kind of economic consequence. But it would be much heralded, it would make big press to be the first place in the world, perhaps, to say, sorry, we won't give you a tax break to overpopulate. Hawaii is part of the slow growth, no growth population area. There will be millions of people uh, attempting to come to our shores and all others over the 21st century. As long as that constitution does not allow us to manage our population, manage who can stay, we are doomed. And that to me is a real issue. Maybe it's better not to look at limits as restrictions, but rather maybe we should look at what kind of life we would like to have our children live in, what kind of world we would like to have our children live in. Would we like it to be like a place like Singapore, where there's smaller than this island but triple its population? It's really whether we can or cannot define in the future whether the things that we, we believe are special will be here. The nice thing about the future is that it hasn't happened yet. It can be whatever we want it to be, no matter how bleak the outlook. The burden of action rests on all who live on islands. Whatever happens to Hawaii in the future, of course, is going to be the result of somebody's plan. And there are lots of plans that are out there. I think one of the really important things for people living here to understand is how much of the future is already in the hands of outsiders or of people who have no 
uh, direct stake in the community here. They may own property, which may not yet be developed. So you may see out there green open space, but if you look at it from the eyes of the future, somebody already has plans for that that you can't see, but which are there in their minds and ultimately in their pocketbooks. In the event that we're not able to turn things around, the kind of future that we would see in 100 years would be one in which there would be um, a, a large emphasis on desalination. We would have our streams pretty well depleted on Oahu. Our um, nearshore reef fish, which are now being fished out with virtually no regulation, would almost be gone. The first thing that will go will be the water. We're now beginning to see the end of it on this island. Obviously, as, as we go along, depleting the environment, we can reach further and further into the point where we have fewer and fewer choices about how we're going to try to keep an ecosystem alive. And the longer we wait, the more we embrace growth, the less chance there is that we will be able to have this many people living this kind of lifestyle out here. We won't remain unique anymore. Um, people that are looking for paradise will move on. You know, they're already going to Bali, they're going to um, the smaller Pacific Islands, South Pacific Islands. You know, people are moving on. You degrade this area and you move on. And um, so Hawaiians are going to be left with degraded lands, you know, and, and trying to make do. Farmers have a certain natural stability uh, by the nature of their job. Um, other people, I think, need that same kind of stability. Maybe it's a little harder to achieve because you're more at mercy of an ever-growing economy. And given that we have an economy that's based on growth, constant need for growth, you just extrapolate on into the future. Um, it's, it's easy to see that it's an untenable situation and you cannot grow forever. Every bit of open space is doomed because every year we need more houses. And every year we need more tourists coming because if we don't have more, then, then our economy is stagnant, right? So we're doomed. Sooner or later, they're going to need this land for more houses. But no one has, has even looked into the question of, well, how much is enough? How much can we handle? We pushed for development plans for this island. They're violating those development plans. They have to because the development plans are based on, they're not based on a population number. They're based on a population percentage. This area is allotted like, what, 10% or something like that. So we're always 10% of 100%. So the 10% just keeps going up. The plans are worthless. It's just a matter of, well, should we put this, uh, should we build over here today or should we, build, should we build over here tomorrow? They think, you know, slow growth is something good. We may as well just do it all now. The task at hand is to balance human needs with available resources. If human needs rise above sustainability, maybe there are too many humans. What we choose to give up and what we can give up may be different. What we view now as essential may pale in the light of survival on an island. There, there needs to be some economic development going on all the time. The question is how much? Should you have more or should you have less? And also, for instance, if you have people who are immigrating, in-migrating into the community, you know, how do they affect that balance in terms of the demand for jobs? And then once you've determined those issues, then the question becomes, well, what is the impact of that development on the natural resource environment base of the community? I believe that you've got to continue to grow. I think that families, economies, companies, it doesn't make any difference, biological principles work. When you stop growing, you die. So I think that there is some growth that you need. But with that said, it's the type of growth and how that growth impacts the economy going forward. Today there's no economic growth and the implication of that is interesting because we have relatively high unemployment, we have people who have lived here all their lives that are now moving away simply because there's no opportunities. We have children who are in third, fourth, fifth generations of being here and who in theory should be the leaders in 20 years, 10, 20 years and they're leaving and they're leaving because there's no opportunities and it's just too expensive to live here. People aren't willing to make the trade-off when there's a 50% difference between living here and another place. I think if we continue to do things the way we've done them since statehood, we will have a community that is worse off rather than better off 30 years from now. 
if you look out over our city, we have uh, practically no major construction going on in the private sector. You are hearing the government saying, well, we'll help out. We'll spend the taxpayers' money. We've got a billion dollars here, a billion dollars there, and we'll stimulate the economy. You don't hear government saying too much about, you know what we need to do is partner with business and help them get things off the ground, create incentives, break down the disincentives that exist and are pervasive in, in government, and uh, make this a, a vital community, attracting investment. I think near term the reality of what we have to deal with is that tourism is going to be a key for strengthening the economy in the next five to ten years. That is where our competitive strength is, that's where we've got the strongest base and the truth of the matter is by an estimates that's 35 to 40 percent. We are a magnificent, absolute beautiful place, but let me tell you that we aren't competitive <laughs> and, and maybe that's okay and in fact Probably a lot of the viewers of this film might say, that's okay, I don't want any more people. I don't want, I'm just fine the way I am. But it's, it's not healthy. I believe that you've got, if you've got a strong economy, you're providing resources that allow you to do a whole host of things. Clearly one of those is environment. You can, in, you can invest in the environment, you can do some things that you simply can't do if you don't have the resources of a strong economy. And as people working together, so that they've got a strong economy and they're still addressing the needs of the citizenry. And they're finding out that they're not opposite each other, but they actually go hand in hand. At a certain point, saying the right things and having good intentions just isn't enough. We must take action to save what is important. 20 years ago, Hanalei River was threatened by a proposed hydroelectric plant and tour boat operations. A grassroots struggle arose to preserve and protect the rich, delicate watershed. An entire ecosystem was rescued, and the river continues to flow. The most important value of the Hanalei River is the water that it provides for taro farming. And at the river mouth, the sandbar that comes in every summer provides a real important fisheries area. The fish come in and breed. We have o'opu, which makes its annual run. And on Kauai, we have a lot of bays and streams that provide that interaction that's important to fisheries. So it doesn't seem that much of a threat. But you look in context of what it provides for the island entirely and the state, I mean, it's really important because on the other islands, you don't have that interaction anymore. I mean, a lot of the streams and bays have been degraded where they don't provide any more important fishery values. One of the most important things about rivers and streams is you can see the health of the community in it. I mean, you look at Alawai and how dirty, polluted it is, and you get an idea of what the health state of the island is. I think over three quarters of the streams throughout the state have been diverted in some way. Most of our rivers and streams have been channelized. And so when we do that, I mean, you ruin the health of the stream siltation that occurs, uh, the lack of um, stream life. And so, you know, most importantly, rivers and streams reflect the health of our community, and the health of our environment. Streams, to me, as a feature of the natural environment, in and of themselves have a right to exist, just like a mountain has a right to exist. And it's, I don't think anybody wants us to create a world in which all natural features exist only at the whim of human beings and to serve their purposes, their economic purposes. So if we take that view, then water becomes a limiting factor in our lives. If a change in lifestyle is inevitable, then directing that change would seem to make sense. Without a deliberate surrender of certain habits, attitudes, and expectations, we risk adding problems to our immediate fate. We could make the situation worse, even while waiting and hoping it will get better. Somebody has to say stop. They can't happen anymore. Do we want to be part of an, of an economy that's uh, highly oriented toward consumer goods? 
or do we want to be part of an economy that's much more traditional in its approach to the consumption of natural resources? We have to limit, we have to apply discipline to what we want in order that people can still continue to have what they need. At the present time, it seems that the global capitalist system is in control of everything, triumphant over the world. In my opinion, I think it is extremely fragile, and I would be quite surprised, in fact, if we are not forced into more local control through a global depression in the early 21st century. You need to have people understanding that uh, transformation is going to be very slow. Even though the shutdown of sugar occurred on the Hamakua coast and overnight that economy was undercut. People's expectations don't change overnight. People still expect that they will be able to have the same lifestyle, to consume at the same level that they were consuming before. Those types of, of expectations, the changes in expectations, have to come if we're going to have a sustainable economy. There's no avoiding it. Just from a very practical point of view, anyone who chooses here in Hawaii to live a life of self-sufficiency is doing us all a service as serving as a possible model of the way we all might have to live in the 21st century. The thing I really love about living off the land is that you can provide for your own self. You don't have to depend on somebody else to do it. If you want to eat fish, you go and catch the fish. If you want the taro, you go and, and pull the taro, cook it, and eat it. If you want to eat lao lao, you go ahead and pick the leaves, go hunt the pig, and make your lao lao. You're self-sufficient. There's hope for everybody, right in your backyard. Right in your backyard. You can get into your backyard and little, open up a little space, even if it's 10 by 10. You can put all of your needs in the ground right there, even if it's only 10 by 10. And then you can say, well, I'm at least, uh, at least I'm a little self-sufficient. <laughs> Mo'omomi Sands, Molokai, West End, windblown, mysterious and teeming with life. The need to protect the area became obvious when the shoreline was threatened by overfishing and misuse. The Molokai community initiated a lease with the State Department of Hawaiian Homelands to protect this valued island resource. Mo'omomi is now managed and preserved by the community. I went away for a while. I went in the military and when I came back, I saw, I saw the difference already for the short time that I went away. And it started getting worse and worse, the depletion of the ocean. It's up to me now, my generation, to do something. I'm not about to kick back and just watch things go to waste. This is where I was born and raised. This is where I grew up, and this is where we get our food. So we had good teaching, and I think that, that, that is what we gotta get back to, how we were taught. Nothing was written. Everything was watched and listened. That's how you learn from the old people. I learned all the different timing, how to fish, the tides, you know, everything. When everything is in sync, you just go right to the spot, and the time is now. Boom. Catch a fish, you go home. Rule number one is take only what you're going to eat. That's rule number one. And you can, um, you can catch a lot of fish, providing that you use them. Yeah? Waste was, was a bad thing in the old days. You don't waste nothing. Yeah, you make use of everything. Pilot project is set up from that point down to the other point down there. And there's two zones, zone A and zone B. Within these areas, you need a permit to fish. It's not for anybody to just jump in the water and go fishing like before, yeah? You gotta, you gotta, you gotta go get a permit. And it's not, it's not a permit where you have to pay money. It just, it's, it's, it's more or less a monitoring system. You're going to limit them from overfishing you know, or taking too much or even going fishing at all. So there's some kind of control in it. If things continue the way it's going right now, it's going to be looking really good down on maybe about three or four years down the road. Already this past year, I can see 
some some uh, population growth in some of the species already. So my purpose here is to maintain that. It's going to be the same thing. You can come over here and get out your food. You like go diving, you can go diving. Join it, you can go pick them up. Still get opihi, get everything that they used to do. You know, the resources are limited. And we as humans, we, we, we stand at the end of the chain, the, the food chain. We're going to eat them. Eat everything in our chain. And we don't put nothing back. But we can, if we akamai enough, we know how this, the, 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 the breeding cycle and all that, we can learn all that, then we know that certain time, we should leave them alone and not catch them. Okay? Well, that's our way to give back to the ocean, to have this knowledge. The journey towards living within our means begins with the attitude that to live on an island, we need to start thinking island. It requires us to acknowledge limits on natural resources, costs of economic demands, and sustainable solutions. The Waianae Coast Community Alternative Development Corporation began a project that would enable their community to thrive by producing its own food. When we began developing our project, the Backyard Aquaculture Project, at first, we were going into doing large aquaculture, big ponds over big lands. But when we thought about who we were as island people, it really didn't make much sense to start that way. What we were dealing with, with were with families who had very small bits of land, thumbnail size. And how do we make those places productive? So we needed to find strategies that work for island people in island situation, island scale. What we're working on is creating work, work opportunities for the whole family that they share and do together that sustains them through the periods of crisis. When the jobs are not there, the family still knows how to work together to do something very basic, and that is to grow food. In the Backyard Aquaculture Program, because we work with families, and part of the condition is that families work with other families, what we begin to do is tear down that isolation between neighbors, within neighborhoods. They work with each other. Like when we go to do the harvest at um, Uncle Tiny's house, the Mole family is there, and the Fairman family is there, the Burgess family is there, and we're there to help each other do the work. Families also understand that in order to join this project, they grow fish not just for themselves and not just for the people in their hui, but it's for the lifeblood of this community. In the old days, this was a fishing town. Wainai was like a fishing town. The fish aren't as abundant as they used to be out there in the ocean. So we're looking for alternatives. Growing them in your backyard. You know, and actually, this is a very good way to grow fish. We'll take all of them that are a pound and a quarter out of here and let the little ones that are below a pound, below market size, grow up to market size. So from here, we'll go to the holding tanks there. The fish stay in that holding tank for three or four days until they can be marketed. This is the beginning of something that has to be done. In Hawaii, like I said, the fish stocks are depleting out there in the ocean. You know, I think, I think this is the feature right here. And what this project really teaches people is that you can dream big but you apply it small and in the application of small now because we were developing our aquaculture park it's an aquaculture agricultural park people can see how this this dreaming now moves from their backyard to a place where they can do much more income for their family grow much more fish for the community so the ability to dream is a critical piece in sustainability. Dreams often emerge out of necessity. Sometimes, where the biggest losses have occurred, we recognize our failures and begin to dream. Kahikinui is found on the rear slope of Haleakala. It was once an enormous dryland forest sheltering native plant and animal species in beautiful diversity. The only complete Ahupua'a land division remaining under Hawaiian Homes land. It stretches for miles in each direction, 
Mauka to Makai, sunrise to sunset. Now an endangered landscape. Most of the forest has been lost to a barren grassland. You know, you look around us and you can see the ramifications of, uh, you know, cattle activity and cattle ranching out here on the South Slope. Uh, you know, this was once a um, closed canopy dryland forest. And we used to hunt this forest extensively uh, while I was growing up. And I haven't been up there since I was like 15. Um, I was, what, 27 at the time when I came back. And one of the first things I did when I came back to Maui was go hunting. Um, it amazed me what was happening to the forest. There was uh, areas of land virtually impenetrable, you know, as I was growing up. And when I went up there, there was basically nothing left. The ferns had all disappeared. The understory is completely uh, been denuded. That pu'u up there is called Manukani. And at, at, at a one time, that whole pu'u was, was, was filled with trees like Maua, Olopua, Kolea, Kavao, Opuhe. And as you can see now, it's just pasture land. Um, what you're looking at right now is a grass from Africa. Kikuyu, they bought it out here around 1930 for forage for cattle. And, and it's extremely evasive and it, it just takes over. How long is the arm of man, huh? To come up here to places that man doesn't even live in, you know, and not, 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 you know, like, not mess around a little bit, completely change it. So that if Hawaiians came here, they'd say, God, I recognize this land, but what happened here? You know, where, where are the birds? You know, where are all the plants? How did you get this land to be so dry? You know, you must be powerful people, that kind of thing, you know, I mean, that's, I mean, you, they would be confused, you know, at what we've done to the land. 8,000 Hawaiians, you know, we suspect lived out here at one time. How did they do that? You know, 95% of our culture was dependent, you know, the activities performed in our culture was dependent upon native Hawaiian plants. You know, if we wanted to go fishing, we needed to harvest a court tree to make our canoes and braiding our olana for our fishing lines and nets and, you know, pounding the hala for our sails. The land stands dry and unforgiving. The biggest resources, stone and space. Managed by a cooperative agreement between DHHL, Kaohana o Kaikinui, and an organization called LIFE, this huge ahupua is challenged by lack of rain and overgrazed plains. Though it's often called a man-made desert, some native Hawaiians see Kaikinui as a window of opportunity to build a community and a dream. Two weeks ago, we signed a license agreement with the Department of Hawaiian Homelands to manage 7,000, approximately 7,500 acres of forest land, which is up in that uh, cloud belt. Right now, what we have here in Kahikinu is something uh, biologists call a dinosaur forest. Yeah. Um, most of our trees in our forest right now are anywhere between 180 to 100 years old. So. We know, you know, repro stopped about 80 years ago. Our core seedlings, or here seedlings, get up to about knee high, about three feet high every year, and then the ungulates come right in and take them all out. And it's been happening for almost 100 years now. You know, we believe that there's still seeds. We still have a seed source. Um, our, our gulches are extremely diversified as far as uh, uh, plant species are concerned. You know, there's stuff like the native begonia, uh, uh, pua makanui, um, Native Sertandras, uh, Termantias, Lobelias. It's just, it's just amazing, these gulches. As every year goes by without management, uh, the species that are capable of coming back like gangbusters get less and less and less. And so the recovery time gets greater and greater and greater. And right now we're at a point in time when there are still big core trees. I call them the kupuna, right? The big great grandmother and grandfather tree. They're still around with their great seed source. You don't need to bring in anything. All you need to do is protect and the land can still respond. And in 20 years, I think the ability of the land to respond will be much less. But, you know, we have to be careful about harming the last grandma and grandpa trees, you know, because right now that's all we have. That's the connection. That's all we have. That's the connection with the future. And if we miss this 20 year window of opportunity, this coal here cloud belt forest will disappear and we won't have a cloud belt out here to capture uh, any uh, water from. In Kahikinui, mankind is responsible for the loss of the forest. 
but we can use technology to bring the forest back. The clouds and rain will return. We can try to recapture what was lost, but all we have to work with is the fragile remnants of native trees and plant life. Only a heartbeat of the forest canopy that once existed. As far as uh, water resources here, it's very dry here. Um, in the upper elevations, probably 25 to 35 inches of uh, rainfall a year, not a whole lot. But fog interception, you know, the precipitation. Right now, if we were in the forest under an ohia tree, it'd be like it was raining. And then you step out of the canopy of the ohia tree and it's, it's just fog. Right? So we believe that, um, you know, someday some type of uh, uh, precipitation fog belt nets or something that we can use as a catchment system. In the old days when this forest stretched from Kaupo across the Ulupalaku and beyond to Makawa, this cloud was much, much more extensive and went across and uh, watered the island of Kohotlave. And since this forest has been so interrupted, the cloud is broken up and now it's just a semblance like a little shroud in the upper part of the mountain. Sunday is really big, but this is a cloud that at one time watered the gardens of people in both directions. And so it's a, it's a cloud that, that, that used to be here much more so than it is today with the rains that it brought and with the comeback of the forest, it can be here again. If a cloud can be returned to the land, so can the people. Resettling an entire Ahupua'a is a challenge, but the Kahikinui Ohana has a creative purpose that goes beyond resettlement. They have plans to restore native sites, grow food, and provide economic opportunity within their own community. When we first got here, the department told us that Hawaiians cannot live on the land because number one, there's no water, and number two, you can't grow anything. So. All these years, the department has been saying that the Hawaiians cannot be, live on the land without infrastructure. And at the same time, they're telling us that uh, they don't have the money to put in infrastructure. So the only place you're going to be is on the list. So what we said was, you know, let us give us the land and we worry about the infrastructure later. So what we vision out here is a resettlement of our Aupua. We're looking at about 100. 25 families. That is 125 families that want to live in open land, undeveloped like this, and they don't want to be controlled in the infrastructure type of subdivision such as we have today. And what we plan to do is not only come here as a community, but come here as a Hawaiian community where everybody help each other, much like the old Aupua concept of our ancestors. Everybody work together, everybody play together, everybody come up together. If our ancestors could live here 8,000 strong, back then, today, our modern Hawaiians can live out here easily because of modern conveniences and modern technology. We're looking at community-based planning, and we're looking at creating communities, creating areas where the community has a lot to say about how they want to settle the land. With our plan, we have the community being part of that forest management program, the community being part of the, the rebuilding of our archaeological sites, the uh, protection of our native plants, the propagation of our, of our uh, trees and plants that need to go back into our aina. We envision after the trees come back, the watershed coming, the water will come down lower to take care of our community that's going to be living in here. This is the first time in recent history Hawaiians will now have the opportunity to live on undeveloped land. You know, maybe uh, if this land was nice land, we wouldn't be here anyway today because we probably have hotels and golf courses and, you know, uh, private subdivisions through here. So it's fortunate that, you know, it is kind of rough and it is kind of dry and it is, uh, uh, it's land made for people that can handle. If you cannot handle, don't come out here. Stay in a city. People come out here and they go, you mean there could possibly be forest out here? You know, you mean this place wasn't always a desert? You know, they're so shocked, you know, and, and for me, that's troubling. That's troubling that not only have we lost the past, but we have lost even the memory that things were any different than they are today. So what's the best way to teach them that, that, that it can occur, that it did occur, is, is to bring it back. Over here, we, we're kind of fortunate, fortunate people over here. We didn't shy away from all our development and stuff, you know. And it was a plus for us. 
Not the other guys to crime because you get too much cars and too much people and too much crime and this and that. That's what, that's what they wanted. Sometimes I just get overwhelmed by the complexities of, of our society. But I feel that that doesn't allow, allow me to walk away from the responsibility of doing my part. If we end up with a society or with a community that is polluted and degraded and, you know, concreted and paved over, that's our fault. If we end up with a society in which we have open space and green and forests and, and clean but somewhat concentrated urban areas, then that's to our credit. If anything that we can learn from the past is Hawaiians took responsibility for the natural resources, that they didn't only use them for their own personal benefit, but they felt a deep responsibility and obligation to care for them. Aloha is not just a feeling, aloha is a system. It's a process by which you work and deal with each other. It's the environment in which people struggle with very difficult issues. The forest speaks if you're willing to listen. It's a problem with today's society. We're not listening, we're only talking. Living on islands, we owe it to ourselves and the rest of the planet to share our visions, to share Thinking Island. The whole world could use the knowledge. As for Hawaii, the islands we leave to future generations will be a testament to our success or grim evidence of our failure. Have you ever really took a look at that uh, space photo by uh, Apollo? when they were on the moon and they looked back at the Earth. It just struck me that clearly our planet is just an island and that our populations have no place to voyage to. What I'd like to see is that we, we recognize that we have, we own this planet and this home of ours can only give so much and that we live within that, that gift. These islands are really miracles in the sea. They're just precious, Stand by one minute. That we have really had nothing to do with creating them, and, and nothing, to, nothing to do with, with making them so special. But we do have a tremendous responsibility to take care of that. Thirty seconds. Everybody get out. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, out.